Uh, well, you're <coughs> walking through a forest and uh, you have a long way to go. And you come to a lake so large that it's impossible to walk round it and so deep and dark and dangerous that you dare not swim in it. But it's winter time and the water is frozen and you're able to skate comfortably across the surface. Well, postmodernism and spirituality is deep and dark and dangerous. But we are going to skate lightly over the surface. We have a long way to go, a long way to travel, and so we will be skating fairly quickly. I want to uh, think with you about what postmodernism is, uh, about how it works, about the possible shape of postmodern spirituality, and then maybe just to outline what a biblical response to that might be. We are going to be thinking uh, quite a bit about Jacques Derrida, who was the intellectual spearhead of postmodernism in the English-speaking world. And at the end, I want to say why I think Derrida was right. Well, that's a tease. That's a tease. And uh, it's a tease, hopefully, that will keep you listening to the end. What can he say about Derrida? Uh, when I was here five years ago, postmodernism was still fairly fashionable. Postmodernism came to us as something bright, shiny, new. It was striking. It was different. Its cultural expressions became very fashionable. It was chic for a time to be postmodern. All the bookshops had lots of books with postmodern in the title. But it's no longer as fashionable as it was. So why are we thinking about it this morning? Can I suggest because it is no longer fashionable. It's no longer fashionable because it is no longer striking and different. It has become the commonplace and the mundane. It has become the way we think and we take it now for granted. So we are here to think about how we think. If you do not think about how you think, you will end up thinking other people's thinks. And that's why it's important to pause and to think about postmodernism. It has become the way we think because it has filtered down into general culture. People may not ever have heard the word or have any interest in philosophy, and yet it is shaping the way that we think and shaping more and more the way the church thinks. Well, all of that was merely introduction, so the clock starts now. What is postmodernism? I want to give you uh, my own definition of what postmodernism is. Postmodernism is the assertion that meaning is inherently and necessarily unstable. What does that mean? It means that all our ideas of truth, our concepts of love, beauty, justice, goodness, what is appropriate and right and um, healthy for us, it means that our understanding of our world and the way in which we communicate that understanding to others, it means that our understanding of ourselves and what it means to be a self is constantly fluid. It can never be fixed. There are no truths or certainties written in the heavens and even who I am is a continuing puzzle. And that is inherently the case according to postmodernism. It's not because of any accident of history, it's not because we're living uh, in the wrong times, it's not because we do not know enough. That instability belongs inherently to meaning itself, and necessarily so. 
that instability is part of meaning. Well, how does that work? We are going to be thinking uh, specifically about Jacques Derrida, who was the intellectual spearhead of postmodernism. But first of all, two concepts which Derrida uses. The first is logocentrism. What is logocentrism? Derrida reads all of Western philosophy as a continuing search for a logos, for a presence, for an originating origin of all meaning. And Derrida says this is something that we long for and something that we need. We need to know that there is something which is stable, which gives meaning stability. We need to know that there is an originating presence, that something is there that makes sense of our world and of ourselves, and not just an idea. We need to know that someone is there. We need to know that someone is there and that there can be in us some kind of stability and meaning and purpose to our life. We are looking for a universal center, a beginning and an origin, what is sometimes called a transcendental signifier, something that gives meaning to everything else and something which is also a transcendental signified, something to which all other meanings will look towards. Well, that's the language of philosophers. Uh, Derrida might have taken his language from the Apostle Paul. All things are from him, through him, and unto him. That's what Derrida says we are looking for. We are looking for this Logos, from whom are all things, through whom are all things, and to whom are all things. And for Derrida, that is a problem. But we desire these things. And behind that desire is this longing for this higher reality, for this full presence of meaning for that which will give meaning and significance and purpose to our life. And we want it to be pure and undefiled, above and beyond the confusions of the world that we live in. We yearn for it, says Derrida. It's interesting that the language he uses is almost spiritual language. Isn't that what spirituality has commonly been thought to be about? A search for higher reality, a search for eternal truths, a search for meaning that will give meaning to our lives. Derrida never calls it a spiritual search, but he does call it a yearning. And for Derrida, that is a problem. Well, Derrida reads all of Western philosophy as a search for that logos. As philosophy, uh, as its story unfolds, the names change and the name of the logos changes and where the center is shifts. But there is always this search for the logos. The names change, the center shifts, but philosophy is never quite able to break with this centering impulse with this yearning and longing. In Plato, who is the archetypal logocentrist, the logos is the eternal world of being, which gives meaning to the world in which we live. For Immanuel Kant, the logos is our transcendental consciousness that shapes and orders the world in which we live. For John Locke, it was natural law. It all begins to become shaky with Nietzsche and Marx and Freud, but they too are centrists. They seek an origin of meaning. The origin of meaning is no longer above us in the world of being or in a transcendental consciousness, but it is in Nietzsche within us, 
In our will, we shape our world by our will. In Marx, it's behind us. It's the forces of society. It's uh, the pressures of economics that determine how we are going to think and understand our world. With Freud, it's beneath us. The origin, as it were, comes from below, from our subconscious, from things that we do not know and cannot control, but which nonetheless shape our thinking and the meanings that we give to life. And Derrida, I would want to say, the name has changed, but it's the same search. Second concept that he uses is the concept of binaries. Local centrism generally expresses itself in binaries. Well, what is a binary? Binary is a set of two related terms in which the first term is considered to be closest to the logos and is therefore privileged over the second, which is considered to be a kind of falling away. Often the second is less valued or less honoured, but it's nonetheless important the binaries go together. We can illustrate that by thinking of a binary that has been very dominant in the thinking of the church, soul and body. And we think of the soul as being somehow closer to God. The body is a kind of falling away. The body is dirtier. The body is in some way less. The body matters but it is secondary to that primary binary, the soul, which is eternal and near to God. Other examples would be theory and practice. Uh, when I went through uh, school, you either went to the senior secondary school where you studied academically, or you went to the junior secondary school where you did practical things and the it was this understanding in society that the intellectual, the academic, the theoretical was somehow purer and better and closer to the origin. And if the practical was not despised, it was considered to be less. Another binary would be speech and writing. In the history of philosophy, speech has always been considered to be somehow purer. It's closer to the source. But writing, it's a little dirtier. It's a little less true. You tend not to trust the written word as much as the spoken word. Intellectual, physical, being and becoming, conscious, unconscious, sane, insane, normal, deviant, rational, emotional, male and female. The kind of rational and emotional and the male and female go together. The rational is considered to be closer to the logos. But women are irrational. I'm just being playful. <laughs> What concerns Derrida is that these binaries are always at the disposal of ideologies. Black and white. Uh, imperial and colonial. Male and female. Ideologies have these binaries at their disposal for instruments of repression. And Derrida's project, his whole purpose in philosophy, is to overthrow logocentrism and therefore shatter all binaries. His passion is a passion for liberty and for freedom, to deconstruct the power of ideologies. He himself was um, French, Algerian, 
So never quite accepted in Algeria and never quite accepted in France. And he was a Jew, which complicated everything. He was conscious of how binaries worked against him. He wants to overthrow logocentrism and break apart the binaries in the name of freedom. And what he wants to replace it with is a total free play of meaning. And we want to think about what that will mean for spirituality. And we can say in many ways that postmodernism has been remarkably successful. Think of the way that feminist thought has taken postmodernism to its heart in order to make break down the binaries of male and female. We don't talk about different sexes anymore because that suggests a binary. What we talk about is gender, which suggests that basically we're all the same. Think of how the binary of sane and insane has broken down. We're all insane now. We're all neurotic. And if you're not neurotic, then you have a serious problem. <laughs> or think about how the binary between normal and deviant has been broken down in terms of people's sexual orientation. There is now nothing that is normal, or everything is normal, but the binary has been broken. Well, if we want to see how Derrida does deconstruct logocentrism, and we want to see how he breaks down the binaries. But before we do that, we need to take a step back. During the 20th century, there was in philosophy a quite striking turn towards language. Heidegger might be a name that's familiar in America. Quine in the United Kingdom, Ludwig Wittgenstein on the continent, George Gadamer. In a different way, also John Austin and John Serrell, if these names kind of connect with you anywhere, they all represent this turn towards language. It was increasingly felt that the problems that philosophy had struggled with from the time of Plato were really caused by using language in the wrong way and thinking about language in the long, wrong way. In particular, the great question, the great puzzle that I think has driven philosophy, the problem of reconciling the subject and the object. Here am I, and the world is out there somewhere. But what is it that makes it possible for me to know this world and to have a world? What is really there? That was Plato's great question. What, what really is there? And how can you know it? And how can it be meaningful to us? And every phase of philosophy has struggled with that question. Well, Wittgenstein would say it's really a non-problem. It's a problem caused by the ways in which we have misunderstood how to use language. And so there was a developing consensus about language. A developing consensus that more and more began to see language itself as ontologically prior. What that means is that we see language not as something which we take out into an already known and experienced world in order to stick labels onto things. In that kind of picture, the world is already there. Uh, and our task 
is to properly name it and describe it and know it. But in this new developing picture, language is ontologically prior. Language comes before the world. We are born into a languaged community. We grow up into language. And from the very beginning, language shapes and determines the world that we experience and know. It is when we find it already an interpreted world and it has been interpreted by language. So Wittgenstein would say in his Tractatus, the limits of my language are the limits of my mind. All I know is what I have words for. If we spoke a different language, we would have a different world. And the content, Gadama, in one of his, his essays, Gadama speaks about the great benefit of classical philosophy because he said classical philosophy could use theology to answer this problem of the subject and the object. How can the subject know the object, how can the object be meaningful to the subject? Well, classical philosophy brought God into the picture. He was, as it were, the one who held it all together. Well, says Gadamer, we can no longer have that theological route to an answer. We have to look somewhere else. And his answer was language. How do we know anything? Because we know it in our language. We come into a language community. Language becomes part of us. Language shapes our world. So the things that I meet in the world are already languaged things. The only being that can be known, says Gadamer, is language. I know this is probably very strange, very peculiar. Um, I'm trying to think of examples. I remember once sitting down uh, and watching on the television one of those Japanese operas. Is it on, on theatre? Is it? And uh, it had a great build-up. This was classical Japanese culture. And it was going to be wonderful and how blessed we were to have BBC Two that was able to present it to us. I sat down and watched it. And it was... <coughs> Just a puzzle. It meant absolutely nothing. And the thought of Japanese people sitting down and watching this and going, ah, ah, I just, I just couldn't see that at all. Gadamer wants to say that the things that we find meaningful, we find meaningful because of language. We are born into a tradition into a language tradition. And that tradition presents to us things which in a sense we already know because we already know the language. Because language gives them to us, they are already familiar. And you and I can sit down and listen to Beethoven and hopefully enjoy him. We can read Shakespeare and it's it's meaningful to us because it's coming out of our language to us. And we can't understand Japanese theatre because it is alien and strange. What Gadamer also wants to say is that what we receive in our tradition is a kind of composite of the thing itself and all the ways it has been interpreted. So if it's a text, say the text of the Bible, we can never really know it in itself because it comes to us as a gift from the tradition. It, it is the text, but it's also the interpretations 
that the tradition has given to the text and it comes to us as a whole. Can any of us, well, any of us over a certain age, ever read the story of Moses without seeing Charlton Heston? <laughs> that's, that's what Gadamer is saying. Most seriously, can any of us ever read the book of Romans without at the same time reading Martin Luther? That's what Gadamer wants to say. You can never get back to the original thing because it's coming to us in our tradition, our language tradition, this language tradition that makes understanding possible. Not only makes understanding possible, but makes the world possible. So word and world, language and reality are inseparable, and the limits of our understanding coincide with the limits of our common language, being that can be understood is language. We cannot know what we have no words for. And because all our thinking is in language, we can never step outside of language to confirm that our language is an accurate reflection of the world. And I myself am a creation of language. For even when I look inward into myself, I have to do it in words. And they are not my words. They are the words that the cultural tradition I belong to have given to me. I understand myself linguistically. Can you see how all that opens the doors to lots of things that were fashionable in postmodernism? The whole idea that we live in a simulated reality. That's what this view of language is saying. Our reality is not the real world. We cannot know the real world. We cannot even know if our language rightly describes the real world. All we have is a world that language has simulated for us. And uh, that whole idea of simulated worlds became very interesting. Think of films like Blade Runner or Matrix One or Dark City. But we live in that kind of simulated world. Well, we're coming nearer to Derrida. One of the thinkers who spent a long time looking at language, he was a linguist, was Ferdinand de Saussure, who published in 1916 his course in general linguistics and he becomes absolutely crucial. De Saussure viewed language as a system of signs to be studied synchronically. In other words, he was not interested in how language moves through time or through conversation. He wanted to freeze language in a single moment and study how it worked and functioned. He wasn't particularly interested, in fact he wasn't interested at all in what people say in concrete speech, in conversation and in discourse, or indeed in what people were saying. All of that he spoke of as parole, French word, and it was of no interest to him. He was simply interested in the system that made the parole possible. And he called that the Lang. Saussure did two significant things. He viewed each sign, each word in the language system as made up of a signifier and the signifier would be the sound that is made or uh, the marks that are written. 
The word was a signifier and a signified. And the signified was the idea or the mental concept we have when the signifier is uttered. This is going to be, you're going to get a sore head with this. <laughs> and by the time we come to Derrida, you're going to need the aspirin. Um, I'm sorry, it's not, it's not easy. Uh, and uh, try and stay with me for as long as you can. And uh, let me give you an example, which is a very common example, one often quoted. The three little marks, C, A, T, are a signifier which evokes the signified cat in an English mind. So uh, you see these marks, you hear these sounds, and you get the mental picture in your head. And what Saussure wants to say is that the relationship between the signifier, C-A-T, and the signified, the meaning, the concept that we, we, we get from it, is a purely arbitrary one. There, there is no necessary connection between C-A-T and the cat. It is purely conventional. And we need these conventions, says Saussure. We all, we all need to be working with the same code here, or we will never understand each other. But it is purely a conventional or arbitrary thing. What he's saying is that the sign is divided from the thing it refers to. C-A-T, the signifier is conventionally attached to this uh, meaning, cat. That makes up the word, which then refers to four-legged fluffy creatures. Okay. But because this is an arbitrary system, because this attaching of the signified to the signifier is a purely conventional thing, the word itself has no necessary relationship with furry creatures. Okay? You're all looking and saying, so what? <laughs> we kind of knew that already, but it was important. Second thing he wants to say is that each sign in the system has meaning only by virtue of its difference from other signs. CAT has no meaning in itself. It has meaning because it is not C-A-P or B-A-T. Do you all know how um, your CDs work? And how your computers work? They are digital systems. And uh, you know what a digital system is. In a digital system, the signal is made up by the differences between zero and one. Okay. Uh, uh, does that help? <laughs> when you listen to Bach on your CD player, all it is is a sequence of differences, of binary code, of the differences between zeros and ones. Don't ask me any more than that. That's as far. But, but the meaning is produced by the fact that zeros and ones are different from each other. That's kind of like what Cezur is wanting to say with language. CAT has its meaning because it is different from BAT. And he would say the whole system is like that. 
The meaning is produced by the differences in the system. He calls it a differential meaning. The meaning is not mysteriously in the word itself. People used to think that words were kind of like that. That in the word itself there was a kind of meaning and a kind of power. Why do we speak about spelling words? Who, who does spelling? Witches do spelling. When witches do spelling, they use words. Words which have power in themselves. And, and that witch's use of spell came over into our use of spell. The power that you can have when you know how to write words properly. Because words are powerful things. They, they have a connection with reality. Use the right words and something happens because there's a link between that word and reality. Well, Sazur is wanting to demolish all of that. What he's wanting to say is that there is no natural link. Well, what are the consequences of all of that? Common sense tends to view language as a mirror in which reality is reflected or as a kind of picture that represents reality. And you can tell if that is a good representation by taking the picture and looking. The boy stood on the burning deck. How do you know the boy stood on the burning deck? Well, you go and you look. The idea is that language, when it is true, corresponds to the real. So Zur's insistence on the fact that language is arbitrary and merely conventional and has no natural link with the world destroys that theory. For language can never picture the world. It can never represent the world. It can never mirror reality because it is a merely conventional system. So, what is truth and what is meaning? For Sazur, truth and meaning are merely the products of system. The products of the differences in the system that make individual words meaningful. Why is the idea of a cat meaningful? to me. Well, I have a dog. If you want a dog, you can have a dog. It's my son's dog, but uh, I could steal it for you. Um, dogs are not particularly meaningful to me. If, it, if this wasn't being videoed, I would probably say the Chinese, I think, have the right approach to dogs. <laughs> cats are meaningful to me. But why are cats meaningful to me? Well, what Sazur is saying is the meaning of cat has nothing to do with these fluffy creatures. The meaning of cat in the language system only has to do with these differences in the structure of language. In other words, meaning is not in the world. It is a product of difference. And so meaning can no longer be thought of as natural, a question of just looking and seeing, or as something eternally settled. For the way your language works determines your meaning and your truth. And there is nothing else. Language produces our world. 
Well, Saussure's interest was in explaining how language works. And his answer was system and structure. <coughs> and structuralism developed in all kinds of directions. It offered to be a philosophy that would explain absolutely everything. Saussure worked in language. Uh, Levi Strauss worked in culture, and he saw in uh, cultural forums and in, in anthropological systems, in kinship rituals, signification systems. Why is it that uh, we order our lives in certain ways? Well, he would say because we find these orders meaningful and there is a structure behind that that determines it. Uh, Roland Barthes took it into literature, an interest in how structure works in literature. You could take it into fashion. There is a language of fashion. Why would it be appropriate for a lady going out um, to a dinner to put on an evening dress and high heels. Why do high heels somehow go with that evening dress? Why would my congregation think it very inappropriate if on a communion Sunday I went into the pulpit with my jog collar and, and robes? I don't have robes, but I have a gown. Uh, what, why? Well, they don't often think it's appropriate not having robes, but anyway, um, why would my congregation think it was inappropriate if I went in with a dog collar uh, and robes and my trainers? You see, there's a kind of system working here that's about meanings and appropriateness. And structuralism wants to say, yes, there's a structure here as well that explains everything that you're doing when you sit down to a meal. Uh, how many of you would sit down to a meal and have your pudding first and your soup last? Why not? But there's a kind of convention at work, even in the way we sit down and have our meals. You see, once you begin to look for structure, you see structure everywhere. Structuralists began to speak about everything being a text. Everything is structure. Well, Cezur and the structuralists felt that at least they had shown that meaning was stable because the structure could be settled and fixed and no one. And the structure is what gave order to our world. Well, that's what Derrida wants to destroy. For Derrida, the whole idea of a logos changed, its name changed, the center changed, all through the, the continuing story of Western philosophy from Plato's being in the heavens to Kant's transcendental consciousness to Locke's natural ideas uh, to to Freud's subconscious, uh, it, it, it was still all logocentric, looking for a center, looking for an origin, looking for something stable that gave meaning to everything. And Derrida says that the structuralists just do the same thing. They think they're modern, they think they're revolutionary, they think they're breaking the mold, but they're just doing the same thing. They're just looking for a center. The center is now a different center. It's structure. It's structure that is the origin of everything. And structure gives stability to our world. But it's just logocentrism. And Derrida wants to break it down. Postmodern fashion show. The lady comes in to show off this elegantly produced evening dress that the designer has just created, wearing green wellies. You see, that's postmodernism, trying to break down the binaries of what is appropriate and inappropriate, 
trying to overthrow the structure. There's a language of flowers. Why is it appropriate uh, for me to give roses to my wife on Valentine's Day? I did it once. I gave her a rose and I sent it to her work because I'm a romantic. But why is that romantic? Why, why do roses say certain things? Because there's a language of flowers. There's a structure that gives meaning to how we use flowers. Now I'm postmodern, I just give her dandelions out of the garden. It's a lot cheaper. But you see, postmodernism wants to break down those structures. Well, how does Derrida do that? Well, he has a number of arguments. This argument about signs, about uh, the signified and the signifier, this argument in which Saussure wants to say that the meaning of the word C-A-T is what it is because it is not M-A-T. Very neat. Very neat. But C-A-T is also not M-A-P or H-A-T. And uh, H-A-T is what it is because it is not D-O-G or C-U-P or... Don't you see, says Derrida, it's not as simple as this. It's not just a case of difference between two things like in our digital CDs or our computers. It's a case of difference between all the words in the language system. So Zur wanted to say, if you want to know what C-A-T means, look at the difference between that signifier and M-A-P. But what Derrida is saying is, that's not enough. You need to look at the difference between C-A-T and all these other words. Uh, and, and when you look at each one of these other words, you're not going to know the meaning of that word unless you compare the difference between that word and all the other words in the language system. So where are you going to stop? This goes on and on forever. Meaning, it's not just the product of the difference between these two signifiers, it's the product of the difference between this signifier and all the others. It's the product of an endless play of signifiers. And to complicate matters even further, Derrida wants to say that there is no clear distinction between the signified and the signifier. Saussure wanted to say that the signifier C-A-T, well, that has a signified, the concept in my head of cat. But, but say you had never met a cat, and you want to know what the signifier C-A-T means, well, where would you look? Uh, you would look in a dictionary. But what would you find in a dictionary? You would only find other signifiers. Derrida wants to say, if you want to know the meaning of the signifier, and you begin to explore the dictionary, you will find nothing but other signifiers. You won't find the signified thing in there. You won't find the idea or the concept in there. You'll only find other signifiers. Like dictionaries tell you nothing that you don't already know. My son wanted a new dictionary for Christmas, one like his daddy's. I said, no, I'm not bothered buying it because it doesn't tell you anything. It only tells you what you already know. You look up a word. If you don't know the words that it gives you, it doesn't help you. 
Does that make sense? If you're looking for meaning, says Derrida, if you're looking for the meaning of CAT, where do you look? You look in other words. But they are not the meaning, they're just other words pointing to other meanings. And you search for these other meanings and you don't find meaning, you only find other words. So it's an infinite program. So Derrida wants to say, whenever you're looking for meaning, you never actually find it. All you find is the absence of meaning. And he's got a nice little phrase. Meaning is always already deferred. Wherever you're looking for meaning, when you arrive there, meaning has gone on something, somewhere else. And you continue your search, but it is always absent. Another way in which meaning is never there, never identical with itself, never given in the thing, is the fact that signs change depending on the context in which they are used. The word C-A-T. Saussure wants to say it will evoke this mental image of a cat. What if you're a sailor sailing in a sailing ship? What does the cat mean for you then? It means the thing that they lash across your back. So the word cat, the sign, the thing that produces meaning in the sign system and the structure is beginning to be a bit unstable. What does it mean in any given context? It's, it's unclear. The old Scottish word mind meant remember. And some of us can remember when you were old enough to travel in tram cars. And as a little boy, I was fascinated by the sign that always appeared in the seat in front of you, which said, please mind your head when leaving the seat. <laughs> <coughs> well, as a little boy, that was a puzzle. Is there any way I could forget it? <laughs> so, so this word mind is doing something different. We, we were coming down from Aviemore last week and uh, we came through Perth and on the motorway we saw a sign. Bag your own manure, one pound a bag. <laughs> now, if all, of you, if all you have is the structure, the difference between words in the language system if that's, all you, if that's all that gives meaning, why do we find these kind of instances amusing? Because we know that something else is happening. And because it was a sign outside a farm, well, that gave it a context. It's an extra linguistic context, which is interesting. There is something outside language that gives meaning. Anyway. Derrida would say, because meaning is always already deferred, because in the dictionary, in the structure, in the system, in trying to trace through the meaning of a word, all we ever find when we follow the signifier, we never find a signified or a meaning. We only find other signifiers. Because words can shift and change depending on their context, then there is an instability in language itself. The whole structure is beginning to shake. If you're reading something, oh, we shouldn't give you any more examples, but if you're reading something and, and there's a, you come to a word in the sentence, what does that word mean? Well, part of its meaning depends on what has already been said and these other words. So these other meanings are somehow in this meaning. And, uh, and yet, 
How I understand that word also depends on words that are still not said in the sentence. Derrida wants to speak about words as we read them, sort of flickering with things already said and with things unsaid. The whole idea of meaning is now extremely unstable. We can never arrive there. It is always already deferred. We can never pin anything down. We can never actually know the full presence of meaning. Meaning is also absence. The absence of meaning. And that means if the language is unstable, my world is unstable. And I am unstable. <laughs> you knew that already. Um, but if all I have to look into myself with is language, and the language is unstable, what I think I am is unstable. How do I know that I was the same person I was yesterday? I can't. Because there is no stable language that helps me. Because any present linguistic meaning is a function of the absent signifiers, all these other words that it's different from, because it's a function of absent signifiers, it can never fully be present, but must be always deferred. For Derrida, there is no closure beyond the ceaseless play of dissemination. And since language itself is a differential system of slippage and dissemination in which meaning is forever deferred, meaning is only an infinite implication. There's just a hint that maybe somewhere you will arrive at meaning, but you never can. That's why, for postmodernism, meaning is inherently and necessarily unstable. It belongs to meaning, to the structure and system of meaning, that it is unstable. Let's try and haul all of this together and uh, see where we've come from. We can only think in language. Because we can only think in language, we can never step out of language and see that our language actually pictures the world. Next step. In fact, language actually creates my world and creates me. Next step, language, and so my world and myself are merely arbitrary and conventional. They are free-floating with no anchor in what is real. But at least we have a system, and the system allows for real communication. We may be free-floating in a simulated world, but at least it's holding together. Last step, the system itself is unstable. Therefore, everything else is unstable. Postmodernism, very quickly, would slide also into the way we read texts and literature. This is important for us as Christians because we read a text. Derrida wants to say that meaning is always already deferred. It's an endless play of signifiers in this dictionary world in which you can never actually arrive at meaning. So the text as a product of language 
is a kind of kaleidoscope of ever-changing meaning. It's wrong to think of a text as something that contains meaning, which as an interpreter or an exegete, it is our job to uncover, for the meaning is not in there. The meaning is just on the surface of the words and the way they're put together, and that is ever-changing because you can never arrive at the full meaning of any of those words. And so interpreters have freedom to interpret. They're not constrained by any meaning in the text. <coughs> there were or are three slogans for postmodernists who read texts. The first is that the author is dead. Derrida wants the author to die because the author works like a kind of logos in his book. What does the book mean? Let's ask the author. He will be the source and the fountain of meaning. The difficulty with that is usually you can't speak to the author. The author's deed. How do you get back into the author's mind? How do you know what Paul really meant? How can you step back into his thinking? That was, that was always a problem for interpretation. But Derrida wants to say it doesn't matter because not just Paul is dead, the whole idea of an author is dead. What is the text? Where does it come from? Well, it's scripted. That word's a word that Roland Barthes uses. It's scripted by Paul. He's the one that kind of writes it down. But he's not the author. He's not what gives it meaning. Remember, meaning only comes from the language system. Paul is just the one that conveys the text to us. But the whole idea of the author as someone who gives meaning to the text is dead. Instead, the text is continually authored every time it is read. What gives meaning to the text? You give meaning to the text by the way you respond to the text. Second slogan is reader responds. There is nothing there which I do not put into it. It's how readers respond that give texts meaning. Uh, Stanley Fish, who's uh, the one most associated with that, he says there are still good and bad readings, but they, they depend not on the text, but on the reading community that you're in. It's the reading community that shape how you interpret the text. And if you're interpreting according to the conventions of that reading community, it's a good reading. <coughs> Why is it we have feminist theologies? and feminist readings, black theologies and black readings, gay theologies and gay readings. And why can they all be true? Because they are all true within their community. And they're true not because it's in the text, but because that reading conforms to the understanding of that community. What would a postmodern spirituality look like? And, and this time we're accelerating. And uh, postmodern spirituality would be, I think, defined or shaped by certain things. It will be different from traditional spirituality, which sought a higher truth and a purer world. That's no longer possible because there are no stable truths. 
So what shape will a postmodern spirituality have? And I'm not thinking of fringe spiritualities, but what would that spirituality look like in the mainstream, in the church, in my church? Postmodern spirituality will be aspirational, not responsive. There is no word that comes from out there. Nothing for me to respond to. The whole notion of revelation is meaningless. The whole notion of the Bible as containing a message given to me has no meaning. It contains only the message I give to it. So spirituality becomes not a response to the word that comes from without, but the aspiration of someone who is longing for something. Have you noticed how we speak about faith in the church? We speak of it as a search, as a pilgrimage, as a journey of faith. We hear that all the time. But for postmodernism, postmodern spirituality, it's a journey of faith which has no destination. Because there is only ever this endless deferral of meaning. You can never arrive. How often have I heard in the Church of Scotland students who are going into the ministry, I, I been involved with students who are going into the ministry and uh, the criticisms of their tutors and the regular criticism is they think they've arrived when they should be on a journey a journey that will never have a destination postmodern spirituality is not about pilgrimage, it's about being a tourist. Travelling but going nowhere. Postmodern spirituality will privilege community over forgiveness and repentance. You see, there are no words that come from without. There is no revelation of a logos. There is no one to whom we are ultimately accountable. So forgiveness and repentance mean nothing. People long for community. We will offer community. But it will be a strange community. It will not be a community of citizens, but a community of tourists who will be there only as long as the journey is pleasant. Why is it people never commit to anything in the church? But you see, if there are no words, and words do not carry meaning, there are no truths to be committed to. Postmodern spirituality will be silent. There's nothing beyond the play of language that can be known because language is the limit of all that can be known. What am I yearning for beyond this play of unstable language? Well, I cannot name it. And even if I found it, I couldn't name it. There is a big emphasis in the church on experience. But in postmodern spirituality, you can never name your experience. And so you can never communicate your experience. We turn away from words and we use icons and symbols and pictures. I was at a lovely retreat for ministers and we were going to meditate together. No reading of scripture, no words. Because for postmodern spirituality, there is no meaning there. But we did have a candle lit in the middle of the room to sit and look at. We might still use words, but they will be silent words because they will be words that don't have any meaning. And so they'll be interchangeable. 
So we can say a benediction in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or we can say the benediction in the name of the parent, the daughter, and wisdom. It doesn't really matter because they are all silent words. They cannot have any meaning. Postmodern spirituality will privilege experience over doctrine and holiness. How do you judge your experience? How do you judge your spirituality? Is it because you're very fervent, like the priests of Baal? How do you know it's an experience of God? You cannot know it's an experience of God. The test will simply be whether it's a satisfying experience. <coughs> But of course, the biblical test is doctrine and holiness. The doctrine and holiness no longer figure very much in a postmodern church. Postmodern spirituality cannot be biblical, for it denies that the text contains meaning and can speak to us. So the text becomes just a kind of playground in which we are all able to build our own spiritual sandcastles. It's not actually saying anything to us. The phrase often used now in the Church of Scotland is, of course the Bible's important, it will always be a useful resource for faith. It's not actually saying anything to us, but we can use it. We can make it a quarry in which we excavate the stone with which we will build our own idols. It will be useful. Postmodern spirituality will privilege spirituality over obedience. Because spirituality is aspiring and not responding, because there is no word coming from out there to me, and no one to whom I am accountable, all that will matter is that I'm very spiritual and obedience will play little part in it at all. Well, if they are very spiritual and they do love Jesus and they're gay Christians and it's uh, deeply important, their faith, well, we will bless this relationship question of obedience never figures anywhere because postmodern spirituality favors the experience over obedience. Well, we're going to cut all this short. I'm running way over my time and I don't really need to do any more about it anyway, um, about this section. Because if you read uh, Church Without Walls, it is an appendix which gives you a picture of postmodern spirituality. Just a couple of paragraphs. If the church is called in this postmodern age to proclaim that God matters, then its worship and the relationships it fosters are key areas of concern. As event, listen to this, as event, truth assumes a kind of dynamic ambiguity. That's Derrida. There is an endless deferral of meaning. Truth is something that happens to you now, but in five seconds time, it may well be gone. And even when it's happening, it is ambiguous. There is no meaning present in us. Truth assumes a kind of dynamic ambiguity, best caught not by creeds or confessions, by, by immediate sacred experience. How do you know it's sacred if you have no words, no creeds or confessions? Ambiguously captured in sac... How do you ambiguously capture something? In sacrament icon and community practices, community practices in which God happens not God is, but God happens in the here and now. For Dean, they're talking about this, this writer, 
For Dean, the truth of God happens in the primary experiences of community, belonging, and participation in worship. If postmodernism has taught us anything, it has reminded us sharply that words and systems, see, this is Derrida's critique of Cesur, words and systems are created by us, not given by God, at the heart of the mystery of the faith. What faith? See, it's a silent word. It doesn't say anything. Because it has no content. What faith? You can't have a faith, the faith, without words, but at the heart of the mystery of faith. There is an inescapable act of trust in the possibility of God. You can't speak about God. Because if he's there, he's outside the language system. So... Nothing you can say, but there's a possibility. An act of faith in the possibility of God. And the secondary aspects of faith, its language, its organization, its ethics, are provisional and revisable. None of them mean anything that is stable and fixed. Everything is fluid. Everything is changing. This creates a fruitful, though painful, tension in the Christian life between trust in God and detachment from the structures we came to express and define that trust. We create to express and define that trust. Christianity invites us to a generous and open-hearted commitment to God, though not necessarily to the words we use to talk about God. We load these words and systems with meaning and we cling to them and they alienate others who cannot subscribe. I've called this postmodern spirituality, not postmodern Christianity, because there is nothing that is further from Christianity than this. Gorgias, who was the nemesis of Plato, said three things. There is nothing. In other words, there is no stable meaning, no origin, no, no being, no logos, no one to speak to us. There is nothing. Even if there was something, we couldn't know it. And if we could know it, we could never communicate it. Postmodernism is older than Plato. And that goes right back to Gorgias. Well, uh, you, you're shivering at the thought of all these notes being turned over. So we'll just keep turning them over. Um, how, what do we say to it as Christians? What, what would I want to say to it? Well, I would want to say to it that a biblical spirituality can critique everything that Sazur and Derrida have said. The idea that we can only think in language, the idea that language is unstable, that there is no connection with the world... Uh, they're really very, very weak philosophical arguments, and they can be easily demolished. Postmodernism really has nothing to stand on. If you want to talk about that afterwards with me, uh, please do so. But spirituality, biblical spirituality, ought to be ready to think these out and to critique them. There is a binary in the church. The binary is spiritual and intellectual. Spiritual is better. Intellectual is somehow are kind of falling away from that. And if we want to be really spiritual, we don't want to be intellectual at all. Well, that's a binary the Bible makes down. Paul, Paul says we want to bring every thought captive to Christ. And, uh, and you can destroy postmodernism. It's not difficult. But I want to say that Derrida is right. He is right, but only so far. Derrida is right when he wants to throw over all the logocentric systems. I see Derrida sometimes like a prophet of old, a kind of deranged prophet, but a prophet of old, ripping down the idols. And we can say yes to this. His mission to destroy all these man-made logocentric systems, that's a mission that we can maybe applaud 
We don't agree with how he does it or what he says or his conclusions, but at least he's tearing down the idols. And we can be glad. The mistake he makes is in thinking that when he's torn down the false gods, there is no true and living God left. But Derrida is also right in holding that there is no stable meaning within the world. Everything is fluid and everything is in flux. What is the being of everything? The ancients used to say, what is the meaning of the world? What is the meaning of being? This being that was outside <coughs> us, independent of us, existing in itself, what meaning could it have for us? It's wrong question. The biblical doctrine of creation raises a different thought. The thought is not whether being can be meaningful. The biblical view it's that being is already meaning. It's not something independent, existing in itself. It's created by God, and because it is a creature of God, it points towards God. The heavens declare the glory of God. Not a problem finding meaning in the world, because the world is there as a message to God's people. Derrida is right when he says that man cannot find stability in himself. Why? Because as a man I am also a creature. I am nothing in myself. I am only as I stand in relationship to God and answer his call to obedience. I am unstable until I find my stability in God. The God who addresses me and the God who I am called to respond to in obedience. The Bible does have the answers. It has the answers to Gorgias. Is there something there? The Father is there, who is the great creator of all things. If there is something there, says Gorgias, I, I cannot know it. Well, I can know it, because that which is there has come into the world and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Logos has been made flesh amongst us. And he speaks our language. Well, Gorgias says, even if I can know it, I cannot communicate it. I can communicate it because the Holy Spirit comes and he opens the hearts of men and women to know him. The answer is there in creation and in the Trinity. Derrida is right when he says, okay, last page. Uh, Derrida is right when he says uh, that we cannot ourselves find and deliver ultimate truth. Postmodernism is right when it says we are positioned in a world and we only ever see things from particular points of view. Our understanding is conditioned by our perspectives. All of that is right, but from the point of view of the Bible, there is only one position that really matters, whether we stand in covenant obedience to God or not. That's where we get our perspective. And from that perspective, we do see the beauty and the glory of the Trinity. We do rejoice in his works of creation. And we do come to understand who and what we are. But we cannot get there by language or by philosophy or by reason, but only by God's grace. It is only God who can bring us to that place of obedience. Two sentences to read and then I'm finished. The search for a logos, for an origin of meaning, which will give stability to our lives, is a religious search. The search of man who, being nothing in himself, restlessly seeks a foundation for his life and being. A foundation on which he can build for himself a city that he may make a name for himself. There is, however, nothing in creation on which his life can rest. And thank you to Derrida. I thank you for postmodernism for saying that. 
There is nothing on which our life can rest. Because creation does not rest in itself. The Christian understands this and knows that in this world there is no neutral ground upon which foundations can be safely built, no place where he can evade the choice of covenant obedience or apostasy. And so he looks to another city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God.